Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the Director of Research and Director of the Middle East Program at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. And it's my pleasure today to welcome uh, you all to our event uh, for our Africa program on uh, South African joint naval exercises and implications for US-South Africa relations. Uh, I just want to off the top uh, here, thank uh, all of our members, uh, board members and donors. Uh, who have been able to join us today or are watching later uh, on YouTube. Uh, we couldn't do these events without your support, uh, and we uh, thank you very much for it. And if you're not a, a, a member or a, a donor to FPRI, please uh, consider becoming one. Uh, this is uh, We do these events for free for everyone, uh, and we hope that you know it's useful to you know the general public and to policymakers, um, both in the United States and around the world. And again, we couldn't do it without the support of our members. Um, our uh, host uh, for today is uh, the chair of our Africa program, uh, Ambassador Charlie Ray, uh, and I am going to uh, hand things over to him uh, to introduce the rest of our speakers and get into the discussion, and uh, I'll reappear in about uh, 30 or so minutes when we get to audience Q&A and help you all moderate that, but uh, Charlie, please take it away. Thanks a lot, Jim, and, and I'd like to echo uh, Jim's welcome to all of you who are joining us. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail on the bios of our distinguished panel. Uh, you, those of you who joined us in our programs before know a couple of, well, three of them, uh, Professor Gilbert Cadi, Cadiagala, Gal, Cadiaglia, and I keep I'm mangling your name, Gilbert, I apologize, Professor Bob Wakesa and Professor Paul Nantulia. Uh, and we have a newcomer today, uh, Professor David Rusa. And we're going to be talking about a topic that didn't really get a lot of play in the media here in the US, but uh, was quite uh, actively covered in, in African and European media. And that was the February joint naval exercises uh, with South Africa, China, and Russia. And what we're going to talk about today is, is uh, basically the implications that, that, that exercises have on U.S.-South Africa relations, uh, and in particularly in, in light of the recent uh, Africa-U.S. Leaders Summit, uh, in which the U.S. government pledged to, to be more actively engaged uh, as a partner with the countries on the continent. Uh, and so we'll look at how this 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 incident coming as it did on the uh, anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine might impact on uh, U.S. South Africa relations. Uh, each of our speakers will talk for about two to three minutes, uh, and then we'll have a, a little discussion on the on the issue, and and then uh, we will turn it over to the audience for for your questions. Please. Put your questions in the Q and A box. Uh, you can do this as we're going along. Uh, I would I would ask that you not put questions in the chat box because we might miss them. Uh, and, and with that, I would uh, like to start by asking uh, for Gilbert if you would uh, say a few words, uh, and then uh, followed uh, by uh, Professor Rusa, then Bob Wakesa, and then Paul Nantulia. Uh, so over to you, Gilbert. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, what I wanted to do was to put the naval exercises between South Africa, China, and Russia within the larger context of the contestation within uh, the African National Congress about the kinds of relationships they want to forge with the United States. And these debates have been around since about 94, uh, where the argument is to what extent, in fact, and to how much should South Africa engage with the United States. And so there is one arm, I think, within the ruling elite that is very skeptical of US-South Africa relations. And this is the, an elite that I would describe as uh, the liberation elite which was equally very skeptical of the US relations with the apartheid regime. And then of course you have the second wing of the ruling elite that sees the US as an important partner, 
a strategic partner to the, to the United States. Uh, so the problem then is how does this translate in contemporary debates about the NABO exercises, about increasing relations between South Africa and China? And I think the argument is simply that um, anytime you have the triumph of the liberation faction of the African National Congress, you are going to have much more leanings towards China and Russia, uh, as opposed to when you have what I want to call just generally the moderate groups who favor very strong US-South Africa relations. So at this, at this point in time, the South African elite uh, wants to invest more in China-Russia relations, even as they continue to have relations with the United States. Uh, but the leaning therefore is towards a position that is ambiguously described as a, an unaligned position, which is that we actually are independent country and South Africa therefore can work with whoever it wants. Uh, but the leaning is more towards a position that really favors the faction that sees more value in relations between uh, China, South Africa, China, and Russia. So the NAVO exercises are occurring at a moment when the debates now are very clearly in favor of those who really don't care what the United States uh, says about those kinds of relationships. I think, let me put it that way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Rusa. Thank you very much, Chair. I think I'm seeing you for the first time and you're seeing and hearing me for the first time. So I'm very glad to see all of you colleagues. Well, I, I will agree because of the shortage of time, I'll agree with some of the points raised by my colleague, Gilbert. But I also wish to say that there's something more to the US South Africa relation than just the independence struggle. Of course, it's true that during the independence struggle, the US was almost on the opposite side and for reasons that were mainly ideological. All of us know, I will not go too much into detail about that, but you may recall that uh, South Africa was looked at by the West as the last bastion against communism. And that way, the United States looked at South Africa as not fighting African liberation movement, but rather as fighting against communists. And matters were not helped by the fact that uh, Cuba was brought in to help Angola fight off you need a rebel movement and also to fight uh, for the independence of Namibia. And so you can see here that the battle lines were drawn, where the West was looked at as an ally of apartheid South Africa and Russia, the Soviet Union then, and to a less extent China, were looked at as allies of Africa. But like I said, because of the shortage of time, I don't intend to go into all that history, but suffice it to say that towards the end of the 1890s, especially with the fall of the Berlin Wall, then the West began to examine its position. Communism was collapsing, everybody could see it. In fact, I was a witness to that because I went to Moscow in the last days of communism. And they saw that truly the system was collapsing. And because communism was collapsing, the, now the West no longer saw the need to just support South Africa or the bastion against communism, which was collapsing in any case. And, and then also, we should not lose sight of the fact 
that if communism had not collapsed at the time it did, I doubt if South Africa would have got independence at the time it did. There would have been blood that in South Africa. But because communism collapsed, and because now the US was the only superpower, it did not see any reason for engaging in what I might call faction scoreboard. And so the US now became more magnanimous towards the South African freedom fighter. Of course, the events were so fast. The release of Nelson Mandela from prison, the unbanning of the African National Congress, and a lot more that we cannot go into now because of the shortage of time. But what I see here is that uh, the Soviet Union then as a nation, especially after its collapse, was really in pieces. And I have uh, always said the collapse of the Soviet Union would be said to have been an implosion because there were so many differences and weaknesses within the system that inevitably it collapsed. And so the South African or the new independent South Africa had to find a way of forging working relationship with the West. For after all, the Eastern Bloc didn't have much offer. It was an inevitable working relationship, which, and fortunately it worked because there was nobody opposing it. But now the Soviet or Russia is now trying to I'll talk about that maybe a bit later, I don't know, because I don't want to overstep my time. Chair, I don't know whether I have, I've not gone beyond my time. You can advise. If I have, I think I'll leave it here, but I'll come and chip in at a certain time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bob. Thank you, Ambassador Ray and uh, colleagues. Um, let me start by, uh, saying that uh, the proposition by the US that uh, South Africa should avoid naval exercises with uh, China and Russia must have been taken as a very difficult proposition by the South African government officials and uh, the ANC uh, you know you know party and, and and you know leaders in South Africa why it is because in the current uh, situation uh, South Africa has invested quite a bit in the so-called Global South, in the so-called non-aligned movement, which is, of course, non-alignment is not neutrality, as we now know. Um, South Africa has increasingly inclined itself uh, towards um, um, <clears throat> Russia and China. Uh, and additionally, in, in, a, in, a, in a sense, uh, the South African leaders must have been taken it as almost hegemonic for uh, the US to demand that the naval exercises between South Africa, China, and Russia be stopped, or that um, uh, the South Africa should not mm. participate. Uh, because in any sense, uh, in any case, it will suggest that South Africa's independence was under question, and that uh, the US was dictating to South Africa. Uh, and um, But even a bigger point is interest. I believe that um, South Africa today has um, greater interest moving towards uh, China. Uh, and one can go through the many commercial, uh, the many you know, monetary benefits it derives from South Africa all the way in the railway sector, in the power um, and energy sectors and so forth. Uh, and, and so if South Africa said, look, we are going with the US position that we should not do uh, naval exercises with Russia and China, it will also be saying that Russia and China, we actually abound, abandoning you at this moment in time uh, in view of the war in Ukraine. And there were indications to that effect. Um, uh, you know, we realized that South Africa's uh, initial position, you know, the foreign minister initially uh, repudiated uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine when the invasion happened in uh, February 2022. Uh, but uh, within a few days, uh, she came back to say, no, look, uh, we are taking the position 
that we're not condemning Russia. And we all know the voting patterns of South Africa and in, during the UN resolutions. So I, I suppose South Africa was put in a very difficult position and decided that it will, it will still go with Russia and China, even uh, you know, in kind of defiance, if you wish, uh, to the US position. Um, and, and as I've mentioned, um, uh, as a BRICS member, as a member of the New Development Bank of the BRICS, as well as uh, a country that is looking towards uh, the East for uh, you know, financial infusion into its economy, which is struggling, I, I suppose that will have uh, been a, a big motivation. Now, there, there were also, I think, assumptions on the US side that uh, because uh, President Biden had invited President Ramaphosa to the White House in September, and they'd had a good conversation during which um, it is reported that um, uh, President Biden leaned on President Ramaphosa to take a position that would be condemnatory to Russia and that the U.S. had launched its uh, U.S. foreign policy towards Africa in South Africa uh, and that there's a dense number of high-level visits uh, that the U.S. is courting South Africa in a big way. I think there was an assumption that all these things, diplomatic and otherwise, will have persuaded South Africa to abandon the naval um, you know, exercises with the Russia and China. But as we know, it will appear that the South Africans, on, at a pragmatic level beyond even just politics, look at it and say it will be a loss uh, for us, even on the economic front, if we abandon our position. Now, the implication here, as I see it, is uh, I suppose the U.S. will be looking very keenly at its relationship with South Africa in view of the geopolitical and geostrategic interests that um, are at play. One position will be that there will be more investment in diplomatic work towards South Africa to persuade it towards the U.S. position. But the other position is the possibility of retaliation. And that voice of retaliation is already being seen in the resolution, um, you know, kind of proposed by uh, U.S. Um, uh, you know representatives, um, uh, you know, Congress uh, to review the relationship between South Africa and the U.S. That that resolution is out there. I I, I don't think it has go, it been debated yet. Uh, but it's um, uh, to review the relations in view of the fact that South Africa is inclined more and more towards Russia and China. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Paul. You're on mute. There Thank you. you. Thank you, Ambassador Ray. Uh, this, I think this is the third or fourth project that I've worked with you on. It's really been a pleasure. And uh, all the other panelists who uh, have, have all mentored and inspired me in, in, in different ways. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll just focus on, on three elements. Uh, the first element is the, you know, the, what I would call the operational or the war fighting, um, the war fighting uh, uh, aspect of this, of this exercise, because when military exercises of this nature are conducted, they can either be to uh, aimed at uh, developing war fighting uh, capabilities of the countries involved, or they can be aimed at a political and ideological signaling uh, and messaging in this particular case. And I think if you look at the uh, assets that were brought into uh, South Africa for this uh, exercise, um, uh, you know, it, 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 when, one looks, when one looks at the indicators, uh, one develops a picture that uh, the operational or the war fighting utility of this exercise were, were really not very pronounced. Uh, with an exercise of this nature, I mean, South Africa uh, deployed a frigate and 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 uh, and and two support ships. Um, uh, you know, Russia deployed one frigate uh, and uh, and one oil tanker. Uh, China de deployed a destroyer, a frigate, and a support ship. So, in terms of war fighting, China actually deployed he more heavily than than the other two. Um, and when one looks at the nature of the exercise itself, uh, I mean, it was you know essentially practicing tactical maneuvers as well as uh, uh, rescue, rescue missions, rescue operations, which are, which, which are relevant, I guess, to some extent, uh, when we consider anti-piracy uh, operations and, and, and this type of nature. But it wasn't really a war fighting uh, 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 exercise uh, uh, as such. 
the Russian uh, 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 vessel was said to be carrying uh, hypersonic, uh, the hypersonic missiles, which Russia has used in Ukraine. Uh, but this was symbolic because uh, there was a lot of speculation as to whether that weapon would be fired during the exercise. It wasn't fired. So uh, what I take out of that uh, exercise is that it was more of an effort to signal politically and ideologically on the part of uh, the three countries. I think South Africa, as, uh, as uh, my other uh, panelists have correctly said, South Africa uh, you know, is driven essentially, uh, um, uh, you know, when one looks at the ANC by ideological concerns, historical concerns. The African National Congress uh, sees the world uh, in, th in those terms. Uh, as um, Gilbert uh, rightly pointed out, there is a very strong and deep bench within the ANC. If one looks at the leading lights of the ANC going all the way back to 1994, the vast majority, I would say perhaps even 70%, uh, received their formative training, political, military, and otherwise, either in the Soviet Union or in Cuba or in the former Soviet republics, you know, East Germany and, and, and so on. Uh, China to some extent, uh, you know, to some extent, but uh, primarily. So, um, you know, it's a deep bench of, uh, of, of, of Eastern, of Eastern uh, uh, expertise. Uh, one only has to look at the, um, the chiefs of defense of the South African National Defense Force, the chiefs of defense, as well as the chiefs of the various services, right? If one looks at them and examines their history, uh, examines their training, uh, the vast majority, the vast majority, uh, so many even speak Russian. Many of them even speak Russian. So there's that connection. There's that. There's that. There's that historical tie, that should not be uh, that should not be uh, discounted. But on the other hand, uh, I believe South Africa also had certain pragmatic concerns, pragmatic issues that it wanted to get across. One of those was basically sending a message to the African continent that South Africa indeed had the gravitas to bring these two major world powers together for a second time, because this is not the first time that this trilateral exercise is being, is being conducted. This is the second in a series that began, into, that began in 2019. So that in itself is a very powerful message. And when one considers the fact that, uh, you know, the resolution that came up for debate in the UN General Assembly, this time we had more African abstentions than we did in the previous resolution towards the end of last year. So one could see uh, a clear linkage between the uh, military exercise, the, in it, the message that South Africa was sending across the African continent and the, um, and the voting patterns uh, in that particular instance. I think um, uh, China essentially wanted to signal that, uh, you know, that the People's Liberation Army is now back in Africa after a three year uh, absence, uh, you know, because of COVID, there's been no in-person military to military exchanges between the PLA and African militaries. And if we recall the visit of the new Chinese foreign minister, uh, Minister Chin, when he visited uh, uh, five uh, countries at the beginning of this year, his number one message was a resumption of political and military high level contacts in person training. And I think that's the Chinese were feeling pressure, uh, significant pressure. I think it's important to recall that while this exercise was, was taking place, the US was also conducting a major exercise for over 23 African countries, right, uh, under, under the US Africa Command, which, which occurred around the same time. Uh, so I think China had an interest in, in trying to send that message. Russia, of course, was trying to signal that uh, despite uh, the fact that it has incurred heavy sanctions as a result of its reinvasion of Ukraine, uh, you know, the Kremlin still has the capacity to conduct international relations and still has international alliances that it can draw upon. So ultimately, at the end of the day, this was really an exercise in diplomatic, ideological, and political signaling than it was in uh, war fighting capabilities and maneuvers per se. I think that's where I would stop. And we can always pick up uh, other issues in the question and answer segment. Thank you. Well, thank you, all four of you, for some very enlightening remarks. I have a, a couple of questions um, that, that have been running through my mind since this first came up. And one is, do you think that, that the South African government, uh, those people in government who had the power to sort of make this decision of South Africa doing this, uh, 
took into consideration the optics of holding this exercise uh, concurrent with the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I mean, it, it, the to, to say that they have the right to do it is is a is a given. I mean, they're a sovereign country; they have a right to to deal with whomever they please. But but what do you think was was this a was this a factor in their considerations of the optics of holding a major military exercise, even though it wasn't a war fighting exercise, or, uh, concurrent with the with the first anniversary of of the invasion and coming on the heels of of South Africa abstaining in the vote for for uh, calling for Russia to to pull out of Ukraine. Um, David, let's start. Uh, Paul, I'm sorry. Let's start with you. Uh, thank you. I, I think I'll I'll, I'll defer okay. to I'll defer to David to my elders first, and then I'll go second. Okay. All right. All right. We'll go with the elder, David. Thank you, what do you Chair. Think? Well, I am really at pain to imagine South Africa was trying to do it like the way some people might have taken it. My guess is. It is Russia which initiated this. That's my guess. I may not have the fact. And then, of course, it was uh, like they say, a friend indeed. It's a friend indeed. When South Africa needed help during the liberation struggle, who came to its rescue? The Soviet Union, which is Russia now. And then China, too. It was also that, that uh, please come in to support our brother. Otherwise, I highly doubt that South Africa had this intention of being defiant before the international community. However, I believe, like I think it was uh, you, but South Africa was practicing its right of independence, its right of uh, non-aligned movement, yes. And so it was saying, fine, whatever everybody says, this is our territory. You are welcome in any case. Let's look at it critically. How much substance is in these drill? Well, they, they bring stuff hardware, but uh, it's not a fighting exercise. It's just symbolic. And it was as symbolic as it was that South Africa gave a helping hand to an ally who needed some bit of something. I mean, Russia had really been beaten left, right, and center. And so South Africa kind of gave it first aid, a kind of resuscitation. But when it comes to South Africa having wanted to offend either the US or the UN or the West, I don't think that was the intention. But rather, I believe South Africa said, okay, here's an ally who helped in our time of need. And since he needs our help, which does not have much substance in it, let's give him. That's my view. Gilbert. Uh, you know, the issues of timing are, are difficult to respond to unless one has privy information on these issues. But let me just speculate here. Uh, one, if the planning for these exercises, let's say if it takes a year, even six months, uh, then one would probably put it in the context of the Ukraine vote. Uh, so because this was February, uh, and then if you're planning from February to next year, February, one could say therefore the link to the Ukraine anniversary uh, makes sense. Uh, but if it was planning prior to that, uh, I would hesitate really to put it more directly to, the, to link it to the UN vote. Uh, and then again, David has raised an interesting issue who initiated uh, the invitation or the exercises. <laughs> and Paul has mentioned that they had a first uh, military uh, exercise in 2019. So again, issues of timing, issues of planning, uh, I can't really honestly say, but even though uh, I think the point about the vote also speaks to the issue around even uh, if it was planned in advance, could it have been postponed? <laughs> That's now from the South African side. I mean, if the South African side wanted to, to at least express some dissatisfaction with the Ukraine affair, 
Would it have postponed the event? Did it have the courage? Did it have the leverage? <laughs> and it's really hard to know if, unless we have an understanding of the planning part of it, uh, and then the, the kind of the invitation, who led this initiative? Bob, you wanna put your two cents worth in? No, no sure. Uh, and I think without uh, regurgitating what my colleagues have said, I will say, <clears throat> Uh, the issues of uh, the anniversary and the symbolism there of notwithstanding, I think the South Africans will have no qualms going with the date. Uh, because in any case, they already have a position uh, on uh, the you know Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is uh, do not condemn Russia, which is that our alliance with Russia is important. So I suppose, uh, and again speculatively, uh, even if the anniversary of the invasion is important, is significant, is symbolic, the default mode will be, where do we stand on this issue? We stand with Russia. So we will still go with it. Uh, and, and at the same time, again, speculatively, um, the Cutlass Express exercises that Paul was mentioning earlier, I, I suppose this will, uh, in the military intelligence circles, will have been known in advance by the Russians, the Chinese, and the South Africans. Uh, you know, of course, uh, South Africa declined to join the, uh, th those exercises in the, in the, on the East African uh, coast of the Indian Ocean. Um, and and um, so it might also be possible, uh, or at least it can be analyzed as um, competition uh, in the maritime waters of the Indian Ocean. Um, and actually, that then brings in another point, and I would like to differ a little with my senior colleague, David. <laughs> I think uh, and this is friendly fire. It's not <laughs> almost like the naval exercises themselves. But my position is that these naval exercises are critical um, uh, beyond the symbolism. Uh, because you, you know, the, particularly where South Africa is positioned on the continent uh, and in the global uh, matters, uh, South Africa it has both the Indian Ocean side and the Atlantic on Ocean side to it. Uh, um, and um, there's a lot of trade. It's a major, I think next to the Mediterranean, it's one of the major trade, uh, maritime trade routes. Uh, so if people are exercising uh, there, uh, the U.S. actually has a monopoly of trade in that region. But if increasingly Russians and Chinese are also getting into uh, that area, just like the wider Indian Ocean, uh, that, that can lead to potential frictions uh, at sea. Uh, and, and therefore, I think they would be very keen to look at the strategic uh, Cape uh, route uh, that, that, that's important. Um, and, and again, um, to, to kind of conclude on this particular point, let's remember that in December last year, I think about 7th of December, a Russian warship, which has been, which was sanctioned by the US uh, called Lady R, actually docked in Simonstown, uh, just near Cape Town. Uh, and this is a sanctioned ship. So I think again, this demonstrates to me that either South Africans were not aware that the US has sanctioned this ship, this particular warship, or they knew that it's sanctioned, but it already it docked in December. This is just a couple of weeks to the, uh, you know, you know the, you know, naval war games. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I have one more question before we we go to, to audience Q and A, and 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 this is uh, comes out of what you all were saying about, you know, who who was the driving force uh, behind this present series of exercises. Um, and I, I would be interested in, in your in your views. I, I realize that we we can't, you know, if we can't, unless we could get into the minds of the senior decision makers, we can never know for sure. But at, you know, your your guess as to which of the three parties was the driving force behind the exercise, its timing, having it now was it was it was it South Africa? Was it Russia or was it China? Um, Bob, you were last. Let's you go first this time. All right. No thanks. Um, I suppose what I'll say is uh, uh, again, uh, this is uh, foreign policy analysis uh, in a speculative manner, and that's what we do actually. When you do not have all the facts at play, 
you look at factors that uh, can help you make a deduction. And in this case, we look at the military capabilities. Of these powers, of these three countries, which one has um, the largest military power? Um, I'll suppose uh, China does today, um, and, and, and therefore China will have uh, had a very strong say in that. Uh, who is the party that will gain the most symbolically, politically, in terms of uh, optics, uh, in terms of image building? It is the battered Russia, as Paul was saying, coming with uh, some heavy, sophisticated weapons and demonstrating it is military power. So on that point, my guess would be the two powers, Russia and China, must have uh, been the ones that uh, coordinated this, again, speculatively. South Africa, as, as has been pointed out repeatedly, even if these exercises were happening on um, the waters of South Africa, uh, its military contribution, logistical contribution, and so forth was actually minimal, even when it's at home. So I suppose uh, South Africa might have been corralled into this. Um, and that, those are, again, uh, my, my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, David? You're, you're muted. Okay. Okay. Now you're, Thank you, okay. Chair. I had uh, some more technical issue here. Like uh, Bob says, I agree with him that South Africa, I think, played along as a good ally. Who initiated? Well, 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 we shall argue till daybreak. Uh, but in my view, let me look at it from a logical point of view. Who had more at stake in this case? Was it China or was it Russia? And to me, it is Russia which had a lot at stake. One, I believe Russia was trying to show a few things. One of which was that, oh look, I'm still alive. And I still can be, I'm capable of being in many places at the same time, despite what has been played out. And then, okay, China has its own interests, but they were not as urgent as Russia's at the material time. South Africa, of course, both Bob and I agree that it just played along as a member of BRICS and also as a good mm -hmm. But looking at the, of course, the evidence is very scanty, but looking at the logical conclusions we can make, I believe it was Russia because it scored a big diplomatic victory. Was its first anniversary of the invasion was marked by drills in the Indian Ocean with two big time allies. And so to that extent, Russia was the greatest beneficiary. And if we are arguing about who was the least, maybe South Africa, I don't know. I wouldn't want to, to, to grade one, two, three, but I'm so really focused on this very little detail of who initiated, I still believe Russia, because it had a lot of stake, more than, than the other two colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Paul? Yeah, no, I think I would agree with my, with my seniors that uh, Russia definitely had strategically a lot to gain from this. After all, it is, it, 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 it is the one that has been sanctioned. It has lost its uh, defense uh, contracts. Uh, you know, to, uh, Russia is the biggest uh, military supplier to Africa. That might change because uh, uh, African countries no longer have access to their uh, export buyer credits from these uh, Russian defense companies that have been sanctioned. Okay, so um, uh, Russia, stood, Russia stood to gain, Russia stood to gain. And I think, you know, this is also not the first time that Russia has, uh, has done this kind of brinkmanship, right? I think it was in 2019 or maybe 2020, when, uh, if my memory serves me right, when the Russia, Russia flew uh, bomber carrier aircraft uh, uh, into South Africa, uh, bomb or nuclear bomber capable aircraft into South Africa as part of as part of military diplomacy. I mean that wasn't an exercise, but it was really as part of military diplomacy. So Russia 
does have this uh, uh, propensity to use to 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 display military muscle as a diplomatic and and and, and, and political uh, signaling tool. So yes, I think I think I think Russia Russia stood to gain. But I also think there's an element that uh, perhaps we could discuss in the Q and A, which is uh, the impact that this might have on the ANC's long-standing uh, posture as a neutral uh, arbiter between international uh, disputants. Uh, the ANC was involved in Northern Ireland. Uh, the ANC, uh, you know, bringing about a solution to that crisis, is very proud of it. The ANC is very proud of the role that it played in Libya, resolving the Lockerbie crisis. The ANC has really punched way above its weight when it comes to these matters. Uh, I mean, uh, Topia Serwale, one of the members of a uh, senior uh, uh, cadres of the ANC at the beginning of this uh, conflict in Ukraine, was talking about, and rightly so, uh, the numbers of uh, MK uh, cadres, uh, uh, the military wing of the ANC, and uh, you know who received their training in uh, Ukraine when Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, right? And that puts the ANC in a very unique position in the global south as an organization that has strong ties with both Russia and with Ukraine, which might have uh, created an opportunity for South Africa itself, the South African government and the ANC as, as, a, as, as a ruling party to bring about some sort of dialogue between the two sides. This would have been quintessentially a foreign policy uh, stance, certainly under Mandela and Thabo Mbeki. Uh, the ANC has always had that deep strand within it. So um, it leaves many, and I would suspect even within the ANC itself, that are asking questions as to whether uh, South Africa can still be able to play that kind of role uh, in the context of these uh, exercises and the timing thereof. This is one thing that I wanted to, to raise. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Gilbert, you get the last say before we go to audience Q&A. No, first I wanted to say that uh, this was not a BRICS exercise. Uh, the BRICS have come in here, but I, I don't think it was a BRICS exercise. Uh, India and Brazil would have had to be involved if it was to be <laughs> a BRICS exercise. So this was essentially China, Russia, South Africa. And I think the beneficiary what the beneficiaries are to Russia uh, for good reasons that have already been mentioned. Uh, but South Africa too, uh, for reasserting its uh, independence, but more important, the South African army has been degrading, all, uh, Navy has been degrading over the last few years. And I think there's just an effort now to rebuild that Navy, its capability uh, was not as solid as it used to be under apartheid. And so these kinds of uh, exercises, I think, are going to inject new energy into the restoration of the ability of the South African Navy to, to play the role that it potentially could, but it hasn't been able to. Oh, thank you. And now uh, we will... Oh, uh, Charlie, it looks like you, you went on, on mute there, I, I'm I, taking I the, the baton anyway. <laughs> right, so uh, we'll turn it over to you. Sure. Uh, we have a, a number of great questions, uh, and I'll try my best to sort of package them together uh, for the group. I also wanted to remind folks, uh, if you haven't seen the link in the chat to fill out a feedback form for this event, please uh, take a quick uh, minute after this uh, event to, to fill that out. Let us know what you think. It really helps us. Uh, you know, better target and curate and put together programs that everyone uh, enjoys. So I, I, I'm going to pick out one or two questions here, but I also I just want to thank uh, the panel here for a really fascinating discussion. I have kind of a question of my own. Um, what, what a lot of this discussion has has brought up, you know, for me is that you know it it, it let's say it it kind of echoes uh, a critique that's been made of uh, the United States strategy towards. Uh, China, uh, I, I don't know if any of you may have read um, Jessica Chen Weiss's piece, The China Trap in Foreign Affairs from back in the fall, which, you know, more or less has asserted that the United States doesn't really have, uh, you know, a positive program when it comes to countering China, uh, you know, a program in, you know, the case like uh, this one with South Africa that doesn't necessarily take into consideration uh, South African strategic interests uh, and react accordingly. 
Um, so I, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, you know, for you all, what kind of recommendation uh, you might have towards, you know, building uh, a, an American foreign policy uh, strategy, you know, with regard to South Africa uh, that, you know, positively challenges uh, or, or, or reacts, positively reacts to, um, you know, the, the relationship that they have established already with Russia and China um, and appropriately considers those interests. Uh, Sort of on the flip side of that, I'll I'll wrap this together with a question from Bert Chapman, uh, which uh, asks, you know, he says, you know, are South African policymakers concerned that they could become more vulnerable to Chinese pressure, uh, like other African countries are, particularly, you know, regarding Belt and Road funding, if they do not support China on, uh, you know, a wider wider array of strategic interests, in particular, uh, uh, Taiwan. So I'll, I'll sort of leave that uh, to the panel. I think we we ended with Gilbert. Do we want to start uh, back then, then again with Gilbert? I think, but it's uh, in the question of vulnerability is very much appreciated uh, within the the South African leadership. Uh, they they they've now dealt with China for about thirty years. And I think they understand China sufficiently to know that uh, I think there are some vulnerabilities, particularly on the military side. The problem is whether there is a strategy to manage uh, uh, those kinds of vulnerabilities. I, I, I don't know whether there is a national strategy on South Africa. On, uh, I'm always worried, uh, for instance, uh, if uh, the Chinese have to take a position on, on Taiwan or they, they invade Taiwan, what would African countries do? <laughs> and uh, it's, a very, it's, it's a very interesting issue because it's going to emerge. And that's why the vote on Ukraine in the UN, Secu in the, in the UN General Assembly is important uh, because uh, the worry in some cycles is that uh, the Russians, uh, the Chinese would expect wholehearted support from its African allies if it were to make such a, a move on Taiwan. And it's a real concern. Uh, but again, you have a, a faction within the leadership that doesn't think that's a vulnerability at all. This is our ally. We can deal with him and we, can, we, have, we have shared interests with the Chinese and therefore we are not reasonably vulnerable <laughs> to intimidation down the road. But let me also just uh, uh, put in the issue around the debt issues in Africa, China and Africa. I've always thought that in the long run, the Chinese are waiting to wield that card at the very end of uh, their maneuvers on, on, on Taiwan, for instance. If the African countries who are heavily indebted to China would have to make a decision on whether in fact they are going to condemn China if there was a vote on the Taiwan issue. So that it's something we have to prepare for, but I don't know whether the South Africans have a strategy on that kind of matter. So it's a very good question. Uh, maybe Jim, we could come back to your question later. <laughs> well, it's part of that for sure, you know, because yeah. that this is what yeah. everyone has in mind when it, come, when it comes to that. Again, like how do you enlist uh, multilateral support, uh, you know, in this, uh, issue, uh, you know, and do it positively with a, and strategically rather than just saying, don't do these things or else, <laughs> you know? Yes, precisely, precisely. Uh, uh, David, go ahead. I think David may be trying to unmute. There we go. Okay. Well, I actually I didn't get to you as you were talking because I think uh, which question is this? I as you can choose to pick up ICC. either. Okay, ICC. Well, as you can see, I'm smiling about it because this is not the first time South Africa is being asked to arrest a head of state. I remember some few years back, towards the fall of. Uh, Omar al-Bashir of Sudan, the ICC had issued an arrest warrant and he visited South Africa. 
but nobody arrested him. Well, that was the time of Jacob Zuma. But still, I, I mean, let's look at it this way. Sometimes we old men love having the, using anecdotes. And I love the anecdote of bailing, bailing the cat. I think some of you must have heard of bailing the cat. Who is going to dare arrest Vladimir Putin? Is it the South African Armed Forces? So I, this one is just a diplomatic gesture maybe, but of, of no consequence. I do not think any country, not even the United States, would arrest Vladimir Putin, unless you want to risk a nuclear. And I know nobody wants that. So I think this one is a non-start. Uh, that's it. Sure. Uh, they, yeah, I think we might have gotten a little confused in the question. There was a question in the chat about uh, South African responses to uh, the ICC's uh, indictment against Putin. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think you know that that's probably a very widely shared <laughs> assumption, <laughs> David, for sure. Uh, Bob, do you want to take up uh, the question of Chinese pressure and or you know a positive strategic program for the U.S. in this regard? No, no, yeah, yeah, certainly. I think um, the question of uh, South Africa's vulnerability to, to, to China al almost uh, can actually be framed. I, I think there are very many approaches to that question, but one of them will be this narrative of uh, uh, China rise vis-a-vis uh, -vis the supposed uh, decline of the West, uh, decline of the US and so forth. Uh, and and um, if we use that uh, you know, framework, one would um, imagine that um, uh, the China rise with the support of South Africa and other countries will demand almost total loyalty from uh, you know uh, you know South Africa towards uh, towards China. Uh, in fact, as you are speaking, I was just thinking about this panel that we are we are on now. We are discussing fairly openly, but if we were discussing with our Chinese colleagues, for example, one will have to be careful what they say. Uh, I mean, there's this self-censorship, but official censorship and so forth. Uh, and, and I think in one of my previous works, I've discussed media narratives as just an example, where you can actually go hammers and tongs on President Biden but you can't possibly do that on President Xi Jinping. And I suppose that also plays out in official circles so that South African officials will um, not necessarily openly have a candid discussion with Chinese colleagues at the old, the, the, those from the West. Um, and, 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 um, and, and therefore, it will uh, suggest that if the Chinese are in any way supporting uh, South Africa, they will demand total loyalty. Uh, no room for much of discussion that there are minimum principles that we have to adhere to. Um, and, and I think um, that then becomes very tricky when we have instances in South Africa, for example, where there have been cases of uh, you know, lack of transparency and accountability in some of the procurement projects, for example, Transnet. Uh, which is the you know rail transport uh, utility entity. There's also been questions raised about uh, funding from the New Development Bank, which of course um, has a heavy Chinese uh, footprint for ESCOM, which is the you know power energy electricity utility company, uh, tending towards some uh, not quite uh, above board kind of practices. Um, so I think the, the the Chinese will perhaps demand that uh, we do not. Uh, um, you know, we hash some of the more difficult questions. We uh, use the backroom diplomacy on the difficult questions. Uh, and, and yet South Africa is a democracy. So, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, they are very vibrant, vibrant voices. Even on the, just the naval exercises alone, it was not as if it was uniform agreement. There were lots of voices of opposition. I think then that will be uh, a tricky, you know, diplomatic arena. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, that's, a, that's a great response. Paul, go ahead. Yes, no, thank you. No, on this issue, um, you know, I, I, when, 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 when I think of the South Africa, the US relationship, um, it's very unique in the sense that, um, you know, there, on the surface of it, there are issues 
that South Africa and the United States share very deeply. South Africa is a consolidating democracy. It has got more independent institutions. The independence of, institu of its institutions has for a long time been a model for the rest of, not just the rest of Africa, but even the rest of the global South, perhaps even internationally. Uh, which ruling party has ever uh, taken measures, successful measures, to eject a governing head of state twice in a row through a democratic process within it? None. Uh, so South Africa has certain qualities, um, uh, certain, certain uh, ideas uh, uh, of governance, uh, that are shared with the United States. In fact, just, just by looking at this, South Africa ideally should be Washington's strongest ally in Africa. Yet clearly we all know that th th that, is not, that is not the case. So there's that, that, there's that aspect. But then you also have this other aspect that all my elders uh, have discussed very eloqu eloquently in this discussion, which is the deep bench uh, and the well-grounded ideology, uh, ideological uh, framing within the ANC and the ANC's political and ideological memories of its allies during its uh, very bitter struggle for, for, uh, for, for, for freedom, which seems to be getting stronger and stronger the farther and farther away we move from 1994 which means that there's a younger, there are younger echelons within the ANC that hold on to those ideas, perhaps even str more st stronger than the, than the generations that went before them. So that makes me think that there is need for a very, very deep, multifaceted, comprehensive, and very serious and frank dialogue, frankly, between the United States and South Africa. Uh, involving political parties, involving uh, different sectors of society. We've not talked about the trade union movements in South Africa. We've not talked about the South African Communist Party and the kind of influence that it may or may not have on the ANC, given that they have a shared, they have a shared, they have a shared history, the tripartite alliance, and what all of that means. I think there's a need for a very deep discussion. But the other thing that South Africa, you know, it's kind of, I always laugh when I, when I, when I, when I think about this. The, the ANC, in, in terms of who is the senior partner, you know, be, you know, when we're talking about South Africa, South Africa, U.S. relations, and perhaps and, and a U.S. initiative, perhaps, to bring South Africa closer and sort of like tilt South Africa away from China. When one looks at the South Africa-China aspect of that. The ANC is older than the Communist Party of China, 1912, Communist Party of China. You know the ANC was for, has been in existence since 1912, right? So one one might argue that the ANC perhaps might might have more to teach <laughs> the Communist Party of China than the other way around. But when one looks at it, uh, by my count, about 80% of the car of the of the current and the previous three national executive committees of the ANC have been trained in Chinese governance academies. Yet South Africa has a very robust governance. South Africa does governance training for other political parties in Africa and other parts of the global South, including Iraq. The Iraqis have been there and all these, the Syrians have been there and so on. So it's, 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 it's really a, a very interesting dynamic, but certainly when it comes to resources and when it comes to, um, to certain asks that might be put on the table, it seems to me that China has more muscle and China can wield more muscle and more influence uh, over South Africa. Um, but I think when it comes to the US side, I really think there's a need for very, very serious and frank and frank dialogue. I don't think the ANC reacts well to, 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 to pressure or to, whatever, to, to the perception of coercive pressure. The ANC is very allergic, is very, very allergic to that. And I think that has been very consistent with its political behavior. Thank you so much, Paul. I mean, I think we're going to probably have to uh, 
figure out a way to hold a conference to discuss some of these issues <laughs> because I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that the, you know, this is this is a very common I think mistake in, in U.S. foreign policy going back uh, a long ways is a failure to appreciate the history of the people we're trying to deal with uh, and, and where they've sat you know in in past geopolitical struggles it's it's very very important um uh, charlie I, i'll leave the honors to you to to say farewells but unfortunately we're we're at time uh and we we've got still a lot of questions uh in, in the chat uh but i think we, we did manage to answer a few of them under under one umbrella uh but thank you guys for a fantastic fantastic discussion uh thanks a lot jim and and thanks and and uh, again as we always seem to have to do apologies to to those whose questions we didn't get to, um, but I have a feeling that that uh, given some of the things that came out of today's discussion, this is not the last time this issue of U.S. South Africa relations will be discussed, and 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 uh, we can we can go at them another time. Um, as as Raleigh always says uh, at the end of of these, you know, uh, we couldn't do these these programs. Uh, without the support of people like those who have logged on today, we appreciate you doing it. And uh, we would appreciate it even more if you're not a member of FPRI, if you would become one, uh, you can go to our site, fpri.org and, and see how to join. Uh, and your support for the Africa program is greatly appreciated. Uh, to our four panelists, uh, thank you. Uh, for your inputs. They have been extremely enlightened, enlightening, uh, and uh, we will see all of you the next time uh, here on, on the FPRI Zoom channel. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Thank you very much for having us. And have thank a you. Good morning. Thank you, all. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, cheers.